الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه All praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The Lord of the heavens and the earth the Creator and maker of this universe And peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So we'll carry on inshallah today But um, obviously because they've taken a bit of time So we try and just do as a revision session inshallah And as a reminder uh, Just briefly I mean um, Some of you have been coming regularly lately uh, Some of you haven't been here for a long time so uh, yeah, um, so basically, um, just quickly again, who remembers in chronological order? What did we discuss from the beginning? Chronological order, because like I said before, it's very important sometimes when we learn in Sirah or like the history of you know the Islam or prophets or history in general. To be honest with you, it's very important to remember the sequence of events in chronological order. So that way, you keep going with the sequence all the time. And it makes it easier for you to remember. So um, what did we start with from the beginning? Just briefly. <clears throat> the importance of Sira. All right, the importance of Sira. Who can just quickly tell us just a few few ideas about, or a few points about why is it important to learn Sira? Just, can I ask someone else? You know, some different people. Some of you were here, I think, the first few sessions, so... Okay, go on, bro. And then learning about the first commitment. And then the Hazrat Shri Salaam narrated the first of the like a broken Salaam on earth. So we're learning about the first human being of the Quran. Because whatever he says, he don't say from his mind, is revealed from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. MashaAllah. So yeah, so for, for <clears throat> excuse me, the brother just reminded us then, so those who didn't remember, so some of the reasons why we should study the seerah or the importance of learning seerah. <clears throat> Number one, by learning the seerah, you are learning about the deen, okay? So we, we learn about the religion, about Islam, by learning about the seerah, the Prophet them. and the reason, or the evidence for that, like the brother said, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it doesn't speak from his mind, but that is a revelation coming to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said the other thing is that we cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the Quran only. No one can say, I want to worship Allah based on the Quran only, but I don't need the, the Sunnah of Muhammad sallam, just the Quran. No one can do that. And what's, what's the reason for that? It's, uh, the obligation on us. To seek knowledge, but why? What is the reason for not worshiping Allah based on the Quran in Quran, only? In Quran, uh, it doesn't say how to pray, how to do the ruku, sujood, and everything. But in the Sunnah, Prophet tell us how to properly perform the ruku and sujood. Mashallah. And, uh, yeah. So that is an example. Yeah. So like in the Quran, <clears throat> it does say that we have to do salah, we have to do zakat, give zakat, go to hajj, but it doesn't explain how to do it. So that means. The seerah or the sunnah of Muhammad sallam, explains the Qur'an to us. See, that's why they go hand in hand together. So no one can say, I want to worship Allah based on the Qur'an only, or based in the seerah or the sunnah of Muhammad sallam only. They go hand in hand together. So the sunnah completes and explains the Qur'an to us. How to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By learning about the seerah, you are increasing the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. You are increasing and developing the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also, like we said, we are learning about the best, the best person who walks on this earth. Best time. Best, best time. Place. Best place. Best generation. Yeah. So we know that we are learning about special people here, people who are unique. Those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised them paradise and this is to be honest with you this is when you think about it deeply this is this is the mercy of Allah upon us upon those who came after the Prophet and the Sahaba because Allah is showing you the characteristics and the manners of people that have been promised paradise so like real examples not only that it shows you that those who will go in the wrong direction before they were not even worshipping Allah or associating partners with Allah. They were bad people, enemies of Allah, enemies of the Messenger, enemies of the Deen. But after they changed. So all these are lessons for us. Allah is showing you a person can change. You can repent to Allah. You can return to Allah all the time. 
Allah is the one who guides. So that is that is the that is the, the beauty of learning about the seerah as well. So it gives you hope. Hope in Allah all the time. No matter how like how many wrong deeds we do, how many sins we make, we commit in our lives, the help is always there. The main thing is we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The door of repentance is always there. And one of the biggest examples, like what we, we're gonna see later on, is Umar radiallahu anhu. He was the enemy of the messenger at the beginning, enemy of the Muslims. But after he became a Muslim, and Allah has honored him to become the second leader after the Prophet So this is the, the beauty of learning about the seerah of Muhammad So what did we talk about after learning the importance of learning seerah? What did we discuss? Arabian uh, Peninsula Yeah, so um, was that before or after something else? Yeah, so the relationship between the message of Muhammad and the messengers before him So what did we say? So the religion, the belief is always the same, which is to worship Allah alone, to believe that there's none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the sharia, the law, the rulings were different from one prophet to another. And then we spoke about Arabia before the time of the Prophet. So we said, what was going on in Arabia at that time? They were no more religious and they see the woman as their own property. And <coughs> did they did they worship Allah? Did they believe? I mean, did they exist? There was the, the Quraysh, the Meccans, the Quraysh people in Arabia at that time. Did they believe that Allah exists or not? Yes, but they advocated like Yeah. So they reached to God. Through them, yeah, yeah. So basically, those people they they did believe in Allah. They believed that Allah exists and everything, but they committed shirk, associating partners with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, and who was the person who started that? Who was the person who brought the, the idols to the Arabia? Amr ibn al Hayy. Yeah, when he went to Sham and he saw them, you know, worshiping idols and stuff. So he, in a way, he liked the idea and then he took one with him, and that's how idol worshiping came into practice in Arabia. So it's very important to remember that those people, they believe that Allah exists. However, they started associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that shows you that shirk is very dangerous. Even though you believe that Allah exists, but if you commit in shirk, associating partners with Allah, then you know. So, <clears throat> so why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide to send Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Arabia at that time? What you know? What was the, what were the, the reasons or the wisdom behind it? Why did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala choose to send Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically to Arabia, specifically to those people, and specifically at that time? To return them to the God. To return them to the God. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Mashallah. So as mercy to mankind. Yeah. And then also to 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 guide them to the right path because that's what that's what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. <clears throat> does because every community that Allah has sent to them a messenger or a prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sends that messenger at at a time when they go in the wrong direction to put them back on track. And that shows, like I said before, the mercy of Allah upon his servants, up, upon his slaves. He's always sending them messengers <coughs> to you know to guide them, to show them the right way, the right path, to lead them to paradise all the time. So that's what was happening before. Um, Muhammad sallam, was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to to um, invite the Meccans to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again to remind them that you're here to worship Allah alone this is your purpose of being there is no one other than Allah that deserves to be worshipped and that is your, your, your aim and your goal in life so then we spoke about what did we speak about before? Uh, after I mean Hmm? Amul Fil. What is Amul Fil? Yeah, the, the, the elephants. What happened? The death of uh, the closest people to the Prophet. His birth. His birth, yeah. So the person that was born in the year of the elephants, we, we spoke about the incidents of Abraha, yeah, Abraha al Ashram. So Abraha from Yemen, what did he want to do? He want, yeah, he wanted. He wanted to demolish the Kaaba. So, what was the what was his aim behind it? Demolishing the Kaaba. Basically, because uh, <coughs> he made the church in Jaman, and 
because all the market flows uh, in the Kaaba and this main center and this called Dutra they <coughs> we make the church in Jama but no one uh, want to come there so he just want to go to the Kaaba so everything got by return to Jama so yeah, but how did he design the cathedral? He designed it with gold and he made it look really beautiful but he yeah. didn't realize that people had a spiritual connection with the Kaaba yeah Mashallah. So yeah, so that spiritual connection with the Kaaba is more than you know materialistic connection. So yeah. So what happened? So Abraha, what there was someone from Mecca and one of the leaders of Quraysh had an incident with Abraha. Uh, Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, who is the uh, the grandfather of Muhammad uh, What happened? Just briefly. She basically Abraha took Abdul Muttalib's uh, camels. Yeah. So Abdul Muttalib went to meet with him and then he asked him about his camels and then Abraha was like, aren't you going to uh, ask, aren't you going to defend the Kaaba? But then Abdul Muttalib said, uh, camels belong to me, but the Kaaba belongs to Allah, so Allah will defend the Kaaba. MashaAllah, yeah. So even, that shows even Abdul Muttalib at, uh, at that time, he had that faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he had that connection with Allah and he believed in Allah and he knew that Allah would protect his sacred house, without doubt. <clears throat> so that that's, that was the year when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born, alayhi salatu wasallam. So, um, what was his father alive? No. So, what was the name of his mother again? Okay. Amina bin Tuwab. Yeah. So, um, so what happened after? You know, she gave birth to him, and then who came to take him? Halima Sadi. She's from the tribe of. Banu Sa'd, yeah. So she, she, she's from the tribe of Banu Sa'd, so Halima. That was the tradition at that time. So the newborn babies, they take them out of Mecca because they thought Mecca is not a good place for babies and stuff. Um, so in the beginning, did they want to take Muhammad or no? Because he's an orphan. Because he's an orphan, yeah. Because normally they get paid for that. So none of the ladies wanted to take Muhammad because he's an orphan. Who's going to pay for him? So they didn't want to take him. Apart from Halima, because she had no other child to take at that time. So she thought, you know what, she, she said to her husband, I'm going to take that little boy. And then he said, okay, take him. So she took him. So what, was, what started to happen after she took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Basically, they got their own camel and there were not enough milk in it. But after she is, uh, uh, took Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, too much barakah in the house. There, and she's able to feed it. Uh, other, and she slept that night while as well. So... Yeah. Yeah. I think the first example was um, when they went there first with the donkeys, and her donkey was the slowest one there. But on the way back, her one was the uh, fastest one there. And people were asking, "Is that the same donkey?" <laughs> and she said, "Yes." So she could see straight away that there's uh, blessings. So, yeah, mashallah. So she so, said, so "Does the, the the blessings and the barakah and the nur of Muhammad sallam, you know, started from an early from an early age, from the beginning?" From the beginning, subhanAllah, you know, the, the nur of Muhammad sallam, is out there. So yeah, so she took him, and obviously her, her own son, her own baby, couldn't sleep for a few nights because they had no food, nothing. And she couldn't obviously breastfeed him because she had no milk. But after she took Muhammad sallam, she had so much, so much barakah, so much food and everything. Um, so what happened to Muhammad sallam one time when he was playing with his foster brother and sister outside? What happened to him? And he took the black spot from the cross of some heart and put it back. And then they forced the brother and they think like he got merged so he back to Halima and she rushed him to see it, but he was fine. So then Halima took it back to, <coughs> to Amr. To Amr, yeah. So basically before, obviously Halima, she took him. And then obviously it was about time to take him back to his mother. And then Halima, she wanted to keep him. Because she saw so much barakah, so much blessings in her life. She wanted to keep him. So she was saying to her, to, to his mother, uh, Amina, saying to her, come on, Mecca is not a good place for him and this and that. So she said, okay. She was very persistent in keeping Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So after the incident when Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam came to him and everything, Halima got scared. She was scared for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she decided to take him back to his mother. So when she took him back, like I said, Amina, she asked her, she, I mean, she knew there was something because she, before he was insisting in keeping Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was begging me to keep him. Well, now you're bringing him back. Why? So when she told her, was Amina scared? 
Yeah, so she wasn't scared at all. She said, but Allah, he is blessed. And Allah will not let him down. The reason being, remember what I said, so what happened when she was giving birth to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yeah, so it was an easy birth when she carried him, when she delivered him. And then also she said, which is narrated in Bukhari, she said that when I was delivering Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I could see a light, a nur coming out, that I could see that the nur reach, reaches out all the way to Sham. I can see Sham from Mecca to here, by the, the nur, the light of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that, subhanAllah, you know, that is, shows you that light, that nur, the nur that is coming to guide humanity. Subhanallah, you know, the nur <laughs> that is coming to this dunya, to this earth, to guide humanity. Nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, um, he went back to his mum, and then what happened, what, uh, uh, at what age did his mother die? He was six. And then who took care of him after that? Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather. And then, at what, at what age his grandfather died? Eight. So what did we say? So we said, any child at that time, that will cause him a lot of disturbance. That will cause him a lot of psychological problems for the rest of his life. Because he was born as an orphan. And obviously just the incident, he's a child, yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is safeguarding him, is protecting him. When Jibreel came to him and he opened his heart and everything. But still, that, him as a child, he, he cannot grasp that. He cannot understand that. And then his mother dies at the age of six. Then his grandfather take, taking care of him after that. And like I said, he's just, gonna, he's just getting used to starting forgetting about his mom. Only two years with his grandfather and he's getting used to his grandfather and then he dies. So, so many changes in his life, so much incidents, so many incidents happening from an early age. Like I said, if he was any normal child, that would cause him a lot of disturbance. That would cause him a lot of psychological problems for the rest of his life. But, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And what I said about all those incidents, Allah is preparing him for what is major than that for what is more heavier than those incidents. Those incidents compared to what's gonna come later on, they're nothing. But Allah is preparing him from an early age. Because carrying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an easy thing. And then obviously, your community gonna fight against you, they're gonna kick you out, all that. It's not something easy, that's very hard. But Allah is preparing him. So after Abdul Muttalib died, who took care of him? Abu Talib, Abu Talib his uncle Abu Talib. So Abdul Muttalib, obviously his mum, the mother is always as a mother, obviously she gives you love, you know, affection and everything. But then Abdul Muttalib was that figure from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, used to look after him. And as, as, as I said before, he had a special place next to the Kaaba. No one was allowed, none of the kids of Abdul Muttalib was allowed to sit there apart from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first few times when he used to sit there, his uncles used to say to him, get down. But Abdul Muttalib said, no, he's my son, let him sit there. And he's, there is something special about him. He's going to be something in the future. Because they could see. So then after, Abu Talib took care of him. <clears throat> and then what did he work as when he was younger? As a teenager and everything. What, what was he working as? Shepherd. Yeah, he was working as a shepherd. And what, what, what is one of the wisdoms behind that? Uh, yeah, so that is something, that is a common, that is something common with all the pre previous messengers and the prophets, all of them were shepherds. All of them. So there's a wisdom by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why he makes them, you know, shepherds at a younger age, before they, before they become prophets and messengers. And a lot of the scholars, when they speak about this, they say, number one, because obviously as a shepherd, you have to look after the, you know, the, the, you know, the whatever, the camels, the goats, the sheep, whatever. You have to, and I have to protect them from the fox, you know, and everything, and you have to gather them and all that. See, after Allah is teaching them, preparing them to gather the Ummah after, to get the Ummah together, to protect the Ummah, to preserve the deen of the Ummah. So from an early age, Allah is preparing them. So, and then after that, who was he working for? Khadija, radiallahu anha. So who, what did he used to do? So business trading to which, which area? Asham. And what, who was the servant of Khadija that used to go with him? 
Yeah, Maisara. Yeah. So Maisara was the servant of Khadija that used to go with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And what did he used to see when he used to travel with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Yeah. So even the clouds used to shade Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Even the clouds used to shade Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is the, the, the incidence of the clouds shading him even from an early age, even from before when he was with his uncle Abu Talib, when he was traveling. When he was traveling with him, and then the monk Bahira or Buhaira, as some scholars say, but the, the um, majority of narrations they say Bahira. So Bahira, when he saw Muhammad وسلم, he saw the signs of prophecy in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like I said, so he asks his uncle Abu Talib, said, "Is this your son?" He said, "Yes." But then he said, but Abu Talib, like I said, he wasn't lying to him because the the, the, the uncle obviously he said the, the status of the father. Especially, he was raising him and everything. So he said, he said, no, there's no way that this child will will have a father. No way. Why? Because he read in the previous scriptures that the last and the final messenger will be an orphan. So the monk said to him, take him back to Mecca. Take him back to Mecca. Because if you take him with you to Sham, they will kill him. And why they wanted to kill him? Remember, we said last week. I think about this. Why they wanted to kill him? Uh, um, Israel, um, tribe. He is from the Arab. Ismail. Ismail, yeah. So basically, we said so. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Who are the, the two sons? Ishaq and Ismail. So Ishaq, who is the son of Ishaq? Yaqub and also Yusuf alayhi salam. So basically, so what what is the other name of Yaqub? Israel. So oh, bani Israel, yeah, bani Israel. So basically, so all the messengers, all the prophets. They are the descendants of Yaqub alayhi salam. So all of them, so basically Yaqub, Ishaq, you know. So the lineage is all goes to Ibrahim. That's why his, 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 his nickname is, the yeah, the father of the prophets. So all the prophets, you know, are the descendants of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Ishaq, all of them, they're coming from Ishaq apart from one. So Ismail, Muhammad alayhi salam, his lineage goes back to Ismail alayhi salam. So Ismail alayhi salam, obviously, after he learns Arabic and everything from a tribe called Jorhum. And then obviously that's how he started speaking Arabic and everything. And then, it, it, you know, it goes down all the way to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So obviously the lineage of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes back to Ismail Alaihi Salam. That's why those who are obviously from the, the Banu Israel or the, all the messengers came from them, they didn't want, especially the final messenger, not to be from the Banu Israel. For them, that is something not, you know, not, not good. Because for them, obviously, in a way, um, the Arabs are not at the same level as them. They are lower than them. So they wanted the final messenger as well to be from the Bani Israel. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the planner. Allah who makes plans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who decides who's going to be the final messenger, who's going to be the first messenger, and where is he going to be from? So Allah knows best. Whatever Allah decrees, that's what we follow, that's what we accept, and that's what we believe in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows, and we know not, Allah knows that the, the final messenger should be from Arabia, should be from Mecca, should be one of the, the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. So the signs, yes. The prophets, so regardless if they are from Israel, like a tribe or from like another descendants, so they killed the prophets. Yes, yeah, obviously, yeah, of course, those who did not believe, yeah, of course, those who did not believe, um, of course, they killed them and everything. That's what we're gonna see later on when um, Khadija took him to the monk, um, and um, what he told him that your community gonna kick you out and everything. So basically. So the signs of the prophecy of Muhammad وسلم, was from an early age and then the incidence of the clouds, like I said, shading him, it was from the beginning because the monk Bahira, when he saw him with his uncle, he saw the clouds shading him as well. And he saw the sign of the prophecy in his shoulder. So then he started working for Khadija, radiallahu anha. His, his serv, uh, the servant of Khadija was Maisara. So he used to go with him and he used to see things that are not normal, things that are unique. It's like, in a way, things that, of course, not in a way, but there's no doubt that things that a human being cannot make happen, cannot make them happen. 
They only happen by the permission of Allah. No one has the clouds shading him, following him. No one has those kind of things. Because this is Allah guiding and protecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he saw the other things that we said, that he's honest, he's trustworthy, he saw the manners and the characteristics of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he used to report back to Khadija. Because Khadija, every person that works for Khadija before, he used to steal from Khadija. They were not honest and not trustworthy. They, they never given her the full amount of money that they made from the business. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was not like that. That's why Khadija radiallahu anha, she was amazed by the, the manners and the characteristics of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and she was attracted to him. So then obviously, um, like I said, but obviously how it was done, her friend went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa she asked him regarding Khadija. She said, what do you think of Khadija? She's testing the water here now. What Muhammad thinks about Khadija. Before she says to him, Khadija would like to, to marry you. She's asking him, what does he think? Does he say, Oh yeah, Khadija, she's a lovely woman, but she's not, I'm not thinking about marriage to Khadija. She's older than me, she's this, she's that. Or is he going to say, yeah, Khadija, she's a very well respected woman. She's an honored and blessed woman. Yeah, I would love to marry someone like Khadija. And that's what happened, obviously. And then we said before, like, Islamically, there's nothing wrong with it. She was at the age of, and he was at the age of 25. So just in Islam, it shows that there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't mean... That should, we must do it. No, but it just shows that in Islam, there's nothing wrong with it. And she was married twice before. She was married twice. So like I said, so here we come to Islam and culture and traditions. So now, like I said, if it happens now, someone goes to his mom or his family saying, I'm going to marry someone, he's 25 and she's 40. They might kick him out of the house. They might think, yo, she's done magic on you. You know, she's done sihr on you, this, that, you are crazy, you this, you that. You know, because they think, because they're not thinking according to Islam. According to Islam. But anyway, so then, as we said, so what, what are some of the wisdoms behind Khadija being the first wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? She had wisdom. Mm -hmm. And um, if you had a younger wife, she wouldn't see like... When the Prophet was there, when he got the message, maybe he would be less inclined to take it about because Khadija, she's already been for everything, she had the wisdom there. What the Prophet was saying. Yeah. So Khadija, anha, she was obviously a wise woman. She's grown up, she's wife, she got experience, and she's, she's a blessed woman as well. A lot of people in the Quraysh wanted to get married to Khadija. A lot of men from Mecca, wanted to get married to Khadija. And one of the reasons being, <clears throat> Khadija was very rich. And because at that time, like we said, in Arabia, women, they did not have the right to inheritance. Women themselves, they were like properties owned by men. So, meaning, if a man got married to Khadija, all her money would become his one, his money, his wealth, because she's not allowed to, 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 to earn or to, to have wealth. But after, like I said, so all this, we're going to see Islam making a difference. Islam coming to finish all these kind of practices. <clears throat> so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got married to Khadija radiallahu anha. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, so who knows how many kids they, they had together? Hmm? Four. What's other names? Mm -hmm. So let's start with the girls, the ladies. Yeah. Ruqayya. Okay, let's stay with the women now, the females. So we said, you said Um Kalthum, you said Ruqayya. Zainab. There's one more. Fatima radiallahu anha, yeah. So it's Zainab, Ruqayya, Um Kulthum, and Fatima radiallahu anha. So what about the boys? Okay. More? What was one of his nicknames? 
أبا أبا القاسم سيد البول كورد القاسم مزمو إني مو Were they all from Khadija? All of them. Yeah? Which one? Do you know? I don't know the mother's <coughs> No? Only one. So all his kids are from Khadija, radiallahu anha. Apart from one. Apart from one. Who is? Ibrahim, yes. His mother is Maria. Yeah, Maria Qibtiyya. Maria is the mother of Ibrahim. But all his kids are from Khadija, radiallahu anha. As we will discover later on, anyway, we'll talk about this in details, inshallah. And also, obviously, all his kids, they will die before him, except 